Welcome to the Magenta House presentation on water and power sustainability in Greater Los Angeles. I'm Cecily Stewart, part of the Magenta House team and a climate educator and activist for the last 12 years. I helped develop the teacher and student elements of this exciting new program. We want to also thank our sponsors, LAUSD and LA Department of Water and Power. They help make this possible. This presentation will cover three components. First, we're going to talk about the history of water and power in Greater LA. Look back, see where all this infrastructure has come from. And number two, we're going to show you how the Magenta House program works, how you can get started. And then number three, we're going to list the tools and links to help you get started in creating your own innovation. So let's talk about the history. Let's get into it. Let's talk about water, right? Here we are in Los Angeles, and we're almost 4 million people. And we live in this arid climate, which is pretty close to a, a desert, right? Well, we use a lot of water. We're thirsty out here. We've got to supply water to all those millions of people. And in California, we use 38 billion gallons of water a day. That's unfathomable, right? How can that even be? Well, let's talk about how we got here. And it all started with this man. This man, William Mulholland, uh, he's responsible for really creating LA's water infrastructure. And he was alive between 1855 and 1935. He's a bit of a controversial figure. And uh, he's um, designed and supervised the building of the LA Aqueduct. Well, driving up the five freeway, you have probably seen these giant pipes coming over the mountains. And that's pulling water from the Sierra Nevada and the Owens Valley. And that's the same infrastructure, the LA Aqueduct, that he created over 100 years ago, right? Now, within 10 years of him building that aqueduct, LA's population tripled, quadrupled from 50,000 to 320,000 just in 10 years. So really, if he hadn't built the aqueduct, if he hadn't pulled that water in, Los Angeles would not be the metropolis it is today. The problem is it was a pretty unsustainable uh, structure because look, we're already feeling just 100 years later that we need water that isn't here anymore, right? I mentioned he was a controversial figure because, you know, he had some political maneuverings and kind of some sneaky uh, things he did. Like, for example, L.A. City did not include the San Fernando Valley when it was created. Right. There weren't even you know, those were orange groves out there and there weren't that many people living there. But the water rights, that was important because you needed the water rights in order to justify pulling lots and lots of water into Los Angeles City. Well, he just sort of adopted San Fernando Valley, incorporated it into LA in order to get those water rights without having the voters vote on it. Mm, he did a few things like that, that mm, people didn't really agree with at the time. And yet he was successful in making the LA aqueduct fulfill Los Angeles water needs. Well, where did all that water come from? Right. Uh, there's this there was this Owens Lake fed by the Owens River, just north of here. And it was a regular lake for practically a million years. And then he built that infrastructure um, and things began to change. There were steamboats that used to haul uh, ore from uh, when we used to mine uh, in the Inyo Range. And that that was a very useful lake for all those years. But as he began to build that infrastructure to create Los Angeles, um, you can see here the building of that aqueduct, those huge pipes hauled in by horses. Um, it began to change. It eventually desiccated that lake. And if you drive out there today um, on the way to Death Valley, you, you, you just see a, a big desert, right? You see giant salt flats where the 
lake used to be. And it only took 13 years to just devastate that lake, uh, using up all that water, pulling that water out of that lake and, and bringing it to Los Angeles. And uh, they started that uh, draw of the water in 1913. And by 1926, the Owens Lake was dry and it's been dry ever since. Who would have thought that a geological feature that was really there for almost a million years could just disappear like that? That's a warning for us. That's something we want to think about as we're imagining a different future. Well, let's talk about power in Los Angeles. So not that long ago, we used to use oil in the street lamps and we used to get around by horse and train. Um, but now look at our freeways. That's all the light that's happening day and night in our city of 4 million people. And each person in Los Angeles uses 12 kilowatt hours per day. Um, and it's hard to get your mind around what what does what does that mean 12 kilowatt hours well it says here's an example like each one of you uses 2.5 gallons of oil and about 10 pounds of coal and about 261 cubic feet of natural gas that'd be an interesting science project to kind of lay that out and kind of get your mind around that but that's what we're consuming every single day Here's a little history. So that was the first power pole ever erected in Los Angeles in 1916, over 100 years ago. And uh, it was in Pasadena. And if you drive out to Pasadena, you know, it's kind of that old city. You can see the old infrastructure of city life in, in Pasadena, maybe more than some of the modern areas of Los Angeles. Well, the valley you live in the valley, it used to be orange groves. And before that, it was grizzly bears and uh, valley oak trees throughout the valley. But now we're really, really power um, hungry. And we use a lot of power on our vehicles, our infrastructure of our freeways. And we figured out how to make dinosaurs power our energy needs. So we've all heard of fossil fuels, right? And so those desiccated animals petrify and then become coal and gas and that's what we burn and we put that co2 up into the atmosphere causing global warming right instead of horses and buggies now we're using cars and and really gas guzzling vehicles um, we're on the way to electric cars very exciting but you know how many more orange groves and how much more wi wildlife would we want to sacrifice for our future infrastructure of Los Angeles? That's where we want to be thinking. What changes would we want to make? Uh, so just like our water consumption, you know, was unsustainable. And that's the point of Mr. Mulholland's story. Um, so is our power usage. Everything we use today plugs into the wall, right? Your home, your school, your classroom is using so much more power than it did just 10 years ago, right? How much more are we going to need in the future? And how might we begin to make changes through innovation now that can allow for that future, make a sustainable future, right? So just kind of also looking at Los Angeles and Southern California, especially, um, we know that we have incredible drought here. You know, we've had a really rainy couple of years. Uh, you've seen there's been a lot of rain. Um, are we out of the drought? Actually, no. Sadly, we are still in our 17, 18, 19 year drought phase. So the water we've been pulling out of the Owens <laughs> Valley Lake for so many years, pulling out of the Colorado River uh, all these years are, you know, really uh, also depleting our aqueducts through our farming practices and our usage of water. Well, you know, global warming is really taking its toll and we're starting to see the results of that hundred years of pulling water and then not having the amount of rain we're used to having. Uh, so the climate is is really causing great change. Here's a way you can see it with your own eyes. So here's the Colorado River over the last two years. And this river, as we said, feeds much of our state. That white ring there that you see on the Rockwall shoreline is technically where 
minerals have been deposited on that wall when the water was higher. So that ring line signifies that more and more we have less and less water to work with. And that's not, not just the case with California. Arizona's dealing with this. Nevada's dealing with this. And we're still in drought. And, and that's the proof right there. So let's talk about wildfires. I know that you all have been affected by wildfires. And in Southern California, the tricky part is that these are wind-driven fires. They move fast. They burn up. Um, houses and, and ecosystems really quickly. They create heat islands, right? Disabling trans evaporation to occur where the water in the air can calm these fires down. Well, you know, with global warming, it's just a hotter, uh, a hotter ecosystem overall. So at a time when we actually need more water to put out the fires, uh, and fight these hotter, destructive, wind-driven fires, uh, there's less available. Well, that's a lot of tough news, right? We're facing the truth. We're facing the infrastructure that uh, wasn't really as sustainably designed and what's going on today as a result of it. But let's talk about the good news. Let's talk about things that are working. So California really sets the trend for honestly, the rest of the world. Other countries watch what we do, and we're making great strides in solar power. 30% of our power is now created by solar, and that's just going to continue, right? That's, in, that's very exciting. Wind power. This employs over 4,000 people now. It might be a future job for you when you grow up, right? But now it's 20% of the renewable power and 10% of the electricity overall. Well, you probably have seen the solar panels and the, the wind turbines increase. When you drive out to uh, Palm Springs, you've seen those since I was a little girl. They've been out there, right? So, and it's increasing. There's now some in Tehachapi and up near Bakersfield. We're increasing that. And that's very exciting. What about water? We now know that we need to capture that rainwater that's really you know, deluging our, our communities, right? The air is getting hotter through climate change. The clouds pick up that water over the ocean, send it over the land, and then dump, right? We need to capture that instead of all that LA River water going out to the sea. Well, that's an opportunity for innovation, right? Desalinization, that's where we take the ocean water and pull the salt out of it. It's a little bit of a controversial and expensive way to make water that we can drink and use, but we need to do it. In fact, we have 12 different desalinization projects in Los Angeles. The largest one in the Western Hemisphere is right down near San Diego in Carlsbad. And uh, that's providing 7% of San Diego water now. So these are innovations. These are things that we've begun to change and it's exciting. But let's summarize. So, you know, it's a big job to change how we use water, how we use power. And that means change at every level, not only infrastructure, but our habits and our behaviors. But it's exciting. And um, we've always looked to our young people like yourselves to change the world, to innovate and find solutions. So it's all hands on deck and you're part of the hands. So we need your help to solve these problems. And we have made a program just to help you do that. And it's called Magenta House. It's a program for middle schoolers like yourselves to create projects and help create a, a future that we all want to live in, right? You're gonna get brainstorming and create new ideas that we haven't thought about yet, right? We'll research and develop together and it's called an accelerator program because we want to accelerate the change that you see is needed. And some of the most advanced projects get hatched in accelerator projects, like an electric car that came out of an accelerator program. And people like Elon Musk are using accelerators to create those SpaceX ideas. And we that's why we built an accelerator program for you. So we are excited and we'll create a science fair-like event at the end in the springtime 
and called the Expo, and your projects will be highlighted and celebrated at Caltech. And that's a very exciting thing to be involved in. All right, so what kind of projects are you imagining you might come up with? It's going to be in one of three categories. So number one, tools. That's an idea like maybe a new water system in your garden at your school, something that's efficient, something that's not wasting, something that's not leaking even. Number two would be programs, a new program. How about a composting program at your school? Something like that doesn't exist yet and something you want to begin to innovate. Number three would be an educational outreach or communication. So talking to people, getting your neighbors to engage in ideas like native plants that use a lot less water, pollinators that help the native wildlife, or anything that relates to water and power conservation and innovation. In these categories, you can build your own project that you want to create change in, okay? And you're going to go to get support for these projects on our website at magentahouse.org. And you can see examples of some of the projects that we've already done in years past. So here's an example of two. One was a school composting project where they were throwing out all their food waste only just a year ago. And now from their lunch program, they're they're capturing that food, creating soil with it, and, and really using a whole lot less water and power to ship that food scraps up to Bakersfield to be composted or using water to uh, create soil, which, you know, if you don't compost, it's a, it's a big drain on the system. Another example is uh, some of the kids in sixth grade created a Power Kid podcast where they did a podcast where they shared uh, um, ideas about power saving and conservation. So getting the word out, right? So you can start to see some of these exciting new ideas might give you an idea, something you want to take on. So just really thinking about this, our history and now an opportunity to be in an accelerator program, this is a call to action. And you can see there's the drawing of the trophy you might win. We're inviting your school to jump in with both feet and invent some innovative projects for water and power conservation and efficiency. Hey, did you know that there are awards and honors and some prizes, actually some cold hard cash amounting to $5,000? That's going to be shared amongst the winning schools. So your projects will be judged on how creative and impactful they are. So exciting. So it's a little, it's a little, it's a little competitive, but it's, it's spirited in a good way. So what are your next steps? So you might be thinking, okay, how can I start today? I love this idea. I'm inspired by this presentation. So you can get started right at home. Um, wow. Okay. How can I do that? Water and power conservation. I use power. I use water. Now you can start turning your own home magenta. That's our way of saying, make your house power uh, and water efficient, right? So our team, in fact, made an in-home assessment guide for you to have you use it and, um, and evaluate your home. What is an assessment? Assessment is where you take, you, you take stock, you know, you, you evaluate your home to see, wow, are my faucets leaking? Uh, how many showers are we taking and how long? How much water is getting used when we do that? How are we washing our clothes, right? You can start to turn Los Angeles magenta because we're on a roll now. Now, where can you find this assessment tool? It's right on our website. You know, it has some complicated stuff like, hey, install solar panels or plant a bunch of trees. Those are great. But we suggest you start by just talking to your parents about simpler changes. You might install a faucet aerator or put LED light bulbs in your incandescent bulbs. That uses a lot less power, right? Dry your clothes on a drying rack instead of washing and drying in a dryer that uses a lot of power. And you can start having conversations with your friends and family about how to explore this. So how do you find this assessment tool? You're going to go to magentahouse.org. There it is on the slide. 
And then you go to resources and we have lots of articles, videos, experts talking about innovative ideas, some tips and tools to get you started. We're going to leave you thinking at the end of this presentation, have you come up with your best ideas, then you'll join us at an organized brainstorming session very soon. And then you'll work inside this accelerator program with all the support to make those projects come alive and come into reality. And then we'll meet again in the spring at Caltech to share out those projects at the Spring Expo. We want to thank you so much for joining the Magenta House Program for Water and Power Sustainability in Greater LA. Magenta House is a project of Pando Populous, and we also want to also remember and thank our sponsors, LA USD and LA Department of Water and Power for making this all possible. And we want to thank you. So we see you soon. Keep thinking. And we'll see you in the Accelerator program. Bye for now.